Good afternoon to uh, you all from a very warm and sunny Copenhagen and uh, a warm welcome to this uh, webinar on Nordic uh, remuneration in uh, uh, Nordic large cap companies hosted by the Do uh, Deloitte. My name is Torbjörn Hagenius and together with Martin Farborg I lead our Total Rewards Advisory in the Nordics. Martin, myself and Tinus Bang Christensen will be your hosts today and we are very excited to launch our report on Nordic large cap remuneration. But equally excited to uh, give you the opportunity to uh, listen to valuable insights from our two very distinguished guest speakers. Harlan Zimmerman, senior partner with CVN Capital and uh, Søren Tor Jensen, senior governance specialist at Novo Nordisk. And I want to extend a special welcome to both Harlan and, uh, and Søren. Let me briefly take you through the agenda that we've put together for you to today. After this brief introduction, uh, Morten will start by presenting on remuneration trends in Nordic large cap companies. Followed by Tina's presentation on Deloitte's Nordic remuneration analysis. Then we move into our second half of the program and Holland Zimmerman's perspectives on pay targets and how to incorporate ESG. We will close with Søren Tor Jensen's insights on annual activities at Novo Nordisk and related to the 2022 remuneration report. Uh, and at the end of the webinar, I also want to mention that we will offer a, a brief Q&A session. You will have seen probably that there is uh, a possibility for you to post questions and you can do so throughout uh, the webinar. And with that, once again, a warm welcome to you all and I'll hand over the floor to you, Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Torbjörn, again, uh, and I'm also equally excited about presentation of this uh, first report on the Nordic uh, remuneration in the large cap companies, actually covering over 200 companies. So a huge data exercise for us to go through all those uh, remuneration reports, etc. But I'm here tasked to give you some insights into what are the key remuneration uh, committee trends uh, in terms of reporting, in terms of transparency, incentives and ESG. I uh, always start with the annual cycle of the remuneration committee, which is maturing both in Denmark and all of the Nordic countries. Obviously, we're in September at the moment, and many companies are looking at their policy to be reviewed, where they should put forward new proposals for the AGM in the spring of next year. But they are also uh, looking into alignment of stakeholder expectations for the remuneration report and the incentive uh, outcomes uh, for the current year. We are here to provide you also perspectives on market updates and, and inputs from the AGMs uh, from the proxy season of the AGMs of, of the springtime uh, of this year, which uh, found um, uh, the data and our uh, perspectives. Very much remuneration committees will have uh, a lot of, on their plate for 2022. Uh, obviously, we are facing a lot of uh, uncertainties in, in the world today, inflation, uh, rising cost of living, workforce issues, aligning executive pay with the wider workforce is a cur current theme, uh, very much uh, also present with the Nordic large cap companies uh, and CEO and wider workforce um, pay. Obviously, as we're also facing geopolitical uncertainties and new risk, we need to address that uh, and adapt and uh, also make appropriate adjustments to executive remuneration. ESG and climate and biodiversity is maturing and will also find its way into target setting and metrics in the executive remuneration and the wider workforce, I'm sure, but it's still early days, but we'll be able to document that by data and give you perspectives of that. Obviously, it's all about uh, building trust in the environment, trust in the communication to your shareholders, to your stakeholders. And there, the remuneration committee actually plays a crit critical role, not only in reporting transparency on the remuneration numbers, but actually transparency 
on the governance and the link between the business strategy, the long-term perspectives of the company's value creation and stakeholder uh, engagement with ESG metrics. On this slide, we highlight the ISS proxy voting uh, for uh, 86 companies across the Nordic large cap companies, uh, covering uh, obviously the five Nordic countries. We don't have as much insights into Iceland, but they're actually included in our survey. Here you can see that actually 22% of uh, the votes voted against remuneration reports in the Nordics, and also a quite a large uh, percentage of companies, actually 61% of the companies also got a vote for, but with exceptions and recommendations to improve especially uh, the lack uh, of disclosures or improve uh, transparency around uh, metrics and target, target levels, etc., uh, which is quite common in the feedback from ISS. On the remuneration policy, similarly, we also saw that uh, a number of resolutions were put to a vote, actually 39 in total uh, of the remuneration policies put to an AGM vote. And there also you see here that 28% or uh, 11 actually also received a vote against uh, and similarly 14 companies then uh, received a uh, vote uh, for with exceptions. So there's still room for improvement according to, to ISS. So similarly we've done analysis uh, in Deloitte uh, based on ISS uh, voting patterns. Uh, here you have the data quite consistently across Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. You will find that consistently throughout our presentation of the data. Hopefully it will make it easier for you to grasp all the numbers. There are a lot of numbers here, but that is actually the data that we've uh, collected for you here. So you see that number uh, of companies actually do get votes against, but more importantly, actually a lot of companies do get uh, votes uh, with uh, a vote for, but with exceptions due to lack of disclosures. So there's room for improvement for all companies uh, in uh, all of the Nordic countries. Uh, and we also agree with that. And we've done our own uh, larger uh, sample test of actually 147 companies ac across the Nordics. And here you can see it's all in the uh, above 70% that can all improve on uh, the level and transparency uh, in, the, in the disclosures. So if we dig a bit deeper into our analysis of the 147 companies, we highlight here some of the key messages for you to think about in terms of what does it actually mean to provide more pay for performance disclosures. We found here that only a minimum of the companies in Denmark, actually 29% can improve, 29% uh, only provide the minimum, the bare minimum legal requirements in terms of transparency. Whereas in Finland and Sweden, it's much more companies that only provide the bare minimum in terms of the legal exercise. They are compliant uh, as, as we see it. However, uh, many uh, companies, especially in, in Finland and Sweden, are not using the remuneration report as a communication tool to their investors and their wider stakeholders in terms of linking, as I mentioned, business strategy, long-term uh, perspectives to uh, executive remuneration and uh, incentives, both short-term and long-term. So here uh, documented a huge potential for improvement uh, for all countries, uh, but more prominently in Finland and in Sweden. In terms of reporting practice, uh, what's put into the single figure number, as we call it, the CEO table, um, the one that catch most attention, that is actually quite consistent in Denmark that the companies do disclose granted pay in alignment with the remuneration policy. Uh, it's the granted pay for uh, long-term executive remuneration over a period of three years, but it's the full amount of that uh, three-year period that's disclosed in the single uh, figure table. As you can see, that's not uh, the same in Finland, Norway or Sweden. Uh, so there, in particular in Finland, you will find that they report more a vested pay type notion or at least paid amount. Uh, I think in Finland have they agreed that it should be the amount that's taxable on LCI that's reported uh, consistently then you can see from 94% of the companies in Finland. But that actually makes uh, somewhat the analysis uh, that we do uh, quite challenging because we can't always adjust for this uh, because then in Finland they don't disclose the, the granted pay numbers. Uh, and as you can see, Norway and Sweden, it's a bit uh, all over the place. You can say it's both granted pay, it's vested pay, but it's also still expense pay, 
which is not really uh, allowed for LTI for remuneration reporting purposes. Here it's important that it's a different number than the IFRS 2 number in the financial statements. So a recommendation to all companies in the Nordics, across the Nordic countries, that is actually to be very specific in the footnote disclosures on your reporting practice. How did you define and come up with the number that's in the uh, single figure table? In terms of the auditors and how much they are involved, it's quite consistent in Norway. It's an audit of the remuneration report uh, in 78% of the uh, examples that we tested. Um, so that's probably the most advanced practice where in Denmark it's consistently a compliance check or an audit. Uh, mostly it's a compliance check. And similar in Sweden, it's also a compliance check on the remuneration report but that's published subsequently to the remuneration report and published specifically to the AGMs in, in Sweden, but also fair, fairly consistent, uh, but still room for improvement. Whereas in Finland, no, no auditors are really requested to report on the remuneration report, it seems, uh, from, from uh, the public domain at least. Um, but that can certainly also improve uh, in Finland. And here, some other data points uh, in Norway. Uh, in particular, it's relevant to note that the they have a chair or committee introduction included in their remuneration report where they elaborate on the context of the company's business strategy, the link to executive remuneration and the performance of the company within the, the current year. So something to look to Norway for, for inspiration there. Activities of remuneration committees is also something that we uh, recommend at Deloitte to include in the remuneration report to be holistic in the remuneration report. It can sit in other parts of the annual report or corporate governance statements. However, we think it should be in uh, the remuneration reports. Here, Denmark is uh, winning that game, so to speak. Uh, even though it's not a competition, it's about learning from each other. Similarly, there's actually a legal requirement in all countries to have a display of the advisory vote from last year's remuneration report in uh, the current year's remuneration report. And here it's interesting to note that only 18% in Sweden have done that uh, in their remuneration reports for the second year. So certainly a reminder here to be uh, compliant with the legislation in the company uh, acts uh, in, in the local countries, which are based on the same legislation, uh, the EU shareholder rights directive. So you can actually see here that it's uh, the same law, the same directive being implemented across the Nordic countries, but being implemented in, in very different uh, ways, actually. So hopefully that will bring about a baseline for aligning uh, a bit more on, on best practices uh, going forward. Further, there's also a requirement uh, in the remuneration report to display the performance criteria and applicable remuneration uh, linked to those performance conditions. Also here in Sweden, uh, it's implemented very much as a legal exercise where the numbers are uh, transparently disclosed in a, in a fixed format, but uh, not a lot of elaboration on the, on the context of the numbers and the link to performance. Total shareholders return, uh, something that we also find useful in many companies to link executive remuneration to, because then there's a direct link to, to the shareholders experience. You will find that that's mostly used in Norway and also in, in Finland, and something that's maturing in, in Denmark and in Sweden, I'm sure, as well. Climate action as a performance criteria is uh, somewhat limited, but Norway is here leading on more companies having included some metrics on climate action already in 2021, uh, but we'll dig into a bit more depth on, on those data points. Uh, and then a few data points on some of the emerging uh, leading trends on diversity and inclusion, uh, whether you set targets for that and make that visible into executive uh, remuneration pay. And here it's limited, as you see, in Norway and Denmark, but still limited numbers of companies that do that. And leading trend, as I mentioned, initially something to think about for remuneration committees this year and, and going forward, that is the commentary linking executive remuneration pay to the pay of the wider workforce, in particular in situations with increasing uh, cost of living, of course. And here, you can see almost no one uh, really commented on that uh, to a large extent yet, but I think that's something to improve on. And similar succession planning in a wider context, succession planning, especially on the CEO position, but how do you structure yourself? How do you uh, govern uh, succession planning at board level, executive level and key uh, personnel? And here it's actually emerging somewhat in, in Norway, but still low digit numbers in percentage. And finally, the number of pages for the remuneration reports here 
is quite consistent in Denmark and Norway with 16 pages, but only uh, six or seven pages in Sweden and Finland. Uh, so that also gives a quite good indication of how uh, the legislation has been um, introduced or implemented here in the in the first or second year. Norway is only the first year, but uh, it's the second year in the other Nordic countries. Then turning to ESG and the insights that we already published uh, in the public domain uh, from the Nordic companies, you will see here uh, that 45% uh, of the companies have included ESG metrics in the annual bonus in the Nordics uh, wide. ESG metrics in LTI is only 19%. And there's very limited disclosure, only 16% or thereabouts uh, disclose the weighting of how much does that ESG metric then matter in the STI or the LTI. And when it is, is disclosed, it's typically in the range of 10% for the annual bonus that the ESG uh, targets weight. And then it's 10 to 20% uh, uh, that they weight for the long-term incentives. So still, uh, I would say that it's early days and here we cover uh, 60 sorry, 86 uh, companies again uh, across the Nordics. And if we double click then on the um, disclosures of those uh, ESG metrics, are they then really true transformational ESG or environmental or climate action uh, metrics to make a change in, in, in the companies uh, and in the structures? It's really here uh, seen that 50% uh, of the companies do actually do include um, environmental targets uh, and also a uh, larger percent, I think it's 55% uh, do include uh, social targets in the short-term incentives. But it's only a limited number and that's the number highlighted here. 17 companies do uh, disclose environmental targets into their STIP and only eight companies, when we turn to long-term incentives, only eight companies do actually disclose uh, environmental targets uh, in this wide group of uh, 86 companies. So certainly something to mature on and only natural that we need to mature along the path of uh, more sustainable strategies, activities, performance management, robust ESG data uh, to make it measurable and to be able to set the right uh, targets to make the change and the incentives for, for the CEOs and executive management to, to work on uh, in the future. But I'm sure we'll come back to that when we talk uh, to Harlan and also to Søren about these issues. And then I'll uh, hand back uh, the microphone to, to Tinus and he will um, uh, take you through the data and the results of um, our executive remuneration and board fees. Thank you, Martin. <coughs> okay. Um, so we have done a lot of number crunching uh, to get solid data and um, as you can see on the screen we have included almost 200 companies in our analysis so the selection criteria is actually the um, it, a market cap above 1 billion uh, euros and uh, looking at companies listed at the Nasdaq OMX index and OBX for, uh, for Norway uh, but again, uh, in Sweden, we have a significant number of companies <laughs> above uh, 1 billion euros. So we actually took uh, approximately the 100 largest companies in, uh, in Sweden. Uh, data sources. So we have been through all public information about the uh, incentive programs and, and, and the remuneration for uh, executives. And we are not only just, you know, taking out data and uh, analyze those. We also done some data washing. Uh, that means uh, sometimes because of, you know, the uh, lack of transparency, we had to decide if, you know, if it was actually a bonus, if it was uh, part of LTI or, or, ba or base salary. So sometimes there is a doubt. So we had to do a lot of data washing also. So just to mention, there's been a lot of work going into this analysis. And as such, that's why now it's September. We are only ready with the analysis uh, this week. Then, uh, of course, we have done uh, local country reports in local currency. But for the Nordic report, we have to do it in euros in order to compare. And then we get some exchange, uh, a currency challenge, exchange rate changes, challenges. And, uh, and that's, why, that's why we have applied the average uh, euro exchange rate for 2021 in order to compare 2020 with 2021. 
So there should be no currency effects in the numbers you see, no, see now. But in case you look into the country reports, then the percentage change could actually uh, differ slightly because of currency effects, just so you remember that. Um, uh, going into the numbers, um, let's start with uh, variable pay versus fixed or versus total pay. So in general, we present the numbers in, uh, in, Euro, uh, in millions of euros, and what you see in brackets is the 2020 numbers. So looking at uh, Denmark and Finland, you can see that, uh, that the variable pay of total pay is actually between 40 and 45, which is slightly higher of what we see in Norway and Sweden. Uh, for Finland, do notice, as uh, Martin mentioned, that they actually have uh, vested uh, pay and not granted pay. And that could be an explanation why variable pay, the, uh, the share of variable pay compared to total pay in, uh, in Finland. Comparing uh, the numbers with 2020, we see actually an, an improvement or a higher amount of variable pay for all countries versus 2020. I guess it's not surprising, uh, thinking about the financial performance of the companies in general in 2021 and the performance of financial markets in, uh, in general. Looking, uh, looking uh, at all executive di uh, directors, we see the same pattern, uh, unless, or however, at slightly a lower level, but also in general a higher number in 21 compared to 2020 but a variable pay will be a smaller amount compared to total pay. Looking into uh, base salaries, we have looking into medium annual base salaries for, for CEOs. And in general, our data is pretty good when it comes to CEOs and, and, and less good, you can say, we're looking into CFOs and other executives, but we have good data for CEOs. And as you can see, uh, on uh, the medium values for, for Finland, Norway, Sweden is approximately the same, around 7.6 to 0 0.8 million euros, uh, uh, the medium uh, level, and slightly higher for Denmark at 1.1. And uh, the reason for that could be differences in taxation. It could be that uh, uh, in general, lower pensions level in Denmark. So as such, you are compensated through the base salary in the, Danish, uh, in the Danish companies. We will see that pattern also going through other or some of our analysis. If you look at the, uh, the changes from 2020 to 2021, it's about the same level for Denmark, Norway and Sweden, between five and, and 6%. Actually, you can see it's, it's very, very close and, and uh, significantly lower uh, for Finland in, in 2021. Yes. Then uh, uh, you can see we also have data of CFOs. We, we, uh, there's a higher variation in salaries, base salaries for CEOs. And also you can see that the, the changes from 20 to 21 is also a, you know, a higher variation in the numbers. And they are between two to seven and 8%, uh, but a bigger variation compared to the CEO levels. For Finland, we don't have any data, or we only have few data for CFOs, and as such, we don't, uh, we not, we, we cannot disclose it in, in this analysis this year. Uh, hopefully, going forward, we will have better data, and uh, companies will improve the uh, disclosure also for CEO, CFOs and other uh, executive directors. Um, uh, if we look at the other element, uh, look at bonus or slash short-term incentives then we see that this is actually a significant part of the uh, total pay in all countries, uh, especially for, for Denmark, Finland and Sweden and slightly lower for, for Finland. Comparing with the, uh, the number in the brackets, the 2020 numbers, again, we see an increase in, uh, in, in annual bonus compared to total pay. I guess it's not surprising. Uh, uh, thinking about the financial performance and, and financial markets and the companies in general in uh, 2021. <clears throat> Looking at all executive directors, we see the same pattern again at a lower level, but, uh, but also uh, we see a positive uh, progress in 2021 compared to 2020. Yes. Moving on to long-term incentives. Uh, we, uh, we see, if you look at, at uh, how much uh, it is of total pay,
Thank you. Uh, sorry. Um, if you look at the, the amount of long-term incentives uh, compared to total pay, then we uh, again we see a very high number for Finland, and we believe it's due to uh, it is due to uh, they actually uh, publish uh, vested pay instead of granted pay, and in a situation in a, where you have positive development in performance and financial markets, then you will normally see a higher vested pay compared to granted pay. And that is actually the explanation for the high number for Finland. And, uh, but again, we have a little bit the same pattern for, for the other countries uh, when you compare it with the, the base salary, that Denmark is uh, there's a tendency of slightly higher uh, long-term incentive pay uh, versus uh, Norway and, uh, and Sweden at CEO level. If you look at uh, all executive directors, we see the same pattern. Denmark are uh, higher compared to Sweden and Norway. And, and, and at other executive directors, we don't have numbers for Finland. But uh, and in most cases, there is a, actually a positive impact from 2020 to 2021. And going into a deep dive into uh, long-term incentives, uh, what is uh, actually the, the instruments that the companies in general uh, apply? And we see, again, a, a kind of similar pattern for, for, for most countries that the performance share units and restricted share units are, in general, quite popular in, in most, uh, most countries in the Nordics. Uh, and I forgot to say that we do also have Iceland included, but we only have a few data points on Iceland. And as such, we have chosen to leave them out of this analysis uh, for today. Um, other tra more traditional, you can say, instruments such as options and warrants is also uh, quite popular uh, <coughs> or a combination of, of the instruments, basically. If you look at total pay, and uh, here we focus on uh, CEO, you will see that, uh, again, there is the same pattern as base salary, that in Denmark there is a tendency of, in general, higher total pay for at CEO uh, level uh, compared to the other countries. And again, it could be subject to uh, differences in pension or uh, extraordinary pay or something like that. This is not included in total pay, which in this case covers base salary, short-term incentives slash bonus, and long-term incentives. But for all countries, you will see in brackets at the top, below the, uh, the country logos, that it's been a stellar year for CEOs in general. So, so on average, they actually uh, saw increases in total pay between 20, 10 to 20%, except for Norway, which actually uh, faced a, an increase of 40%. The medium increase was 40% in Norway. But as you can see from the absolute numbers, that they are also coming from a lower level compared to the, uh, to the other countries uh, in the Nordics. Then it could be interesting to see the size effect, because uh, as you might expect, and what we believe, there should be a kind of uh, size effect in terms of market cap versus uh, base salary. And why do we f focus on base salary and not total pay? It's because, uh, as I just uh, presented before, there is, a, there is a, you know, the higher base salary, we also see a tendency to higher uh, payout from uh, short-term incentives and also from long-term incentives. So in this case, we have focused on base salary versus market cap. And we have done a number of regressions, uh, regression analysis for each country. And, uh, and what we see is actually a quite a good correlation, as you can see on the screens, for instance, uh, yeah, for Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. And since the axes are actually the same, then you can see that the slope of the uh, trend line we have added is almost similar for Finland, Sweden, and, and Norway. And, and interestingly, again, it seems that there is a slightly higher slope on the trend line uh, for, for Denmark. Um, uh, another, uh, another outcome of this analysis is that the variation around the trend line, so that's the uncertainty of the analysis, is actually higher for, uh, for smaller large cap versus uh, higher large cap. Uh, so especially for Sweden, I think the correlation is pretty good for the other countries, but as you can see for Sweden, for the smaller large cap, there's a higher variation around the trend line. So again, uh, of course, there is some uncertainty uh, also in the statistics here. 
Um, then I have added a uh, vertical line, you can see, around a market cap of 30 billion euros. I've added a vertical line. So what I wanted to see, if I, if I, use, uh, if I compare the regression from each country, see where there's an intersection between the trend line and the vertical line, then I can see if I, in general, have a market cap of 30 billion euros, then I can see uh, on the other axis that uh, for Finland, Sweden and Norway, then the intersection is uh, approximately at 1 million euros. That's the, you can say, the, the base salary of the CEO. And that is uh, approximately the same level for Norway, Sweden and Finland. And looking into the Danish analysis, then it's slightly higher again. It's 1.5 million euros. So the same picture as we have seen uh, for the medium, uh, you can say, pay uh, that I presented before. What I've done here is actually I've excluded a couple of uh, companies. So the really blue chip companies like AstraZeneca, Equinor and Novo Nordisk, we have taken them out since their market cap is way higher than 80 billion, as you can see from the axis. Um, and, uh, but, I will in, but, but they show kind of the same picture if I add it to uh, the analysis. What I think is interesting is actually what if we combine them? Because then we have many data points and we have a Nordic regression. So what is the Nordic correlation between base salary and market cap? And again, we find a, 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 a fairly good correlation especially when you are above 5 billion euros. And uh, then this, you see the trend line there, there, there is a, 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 a clear trend in the numbers. And again, a higher variation around the trend line for smaller large cap. So I think actually uh, also going forward, when we, uh, every year we're going to do this analysis, we will qualify the data and we will look at trend lines from year to year. Um, also another interesting um, conclusion here could be that there seems to be a kind of glass ceiling. So if you look at, uh, and, and wh where's that glass ceiling in terms of base salary? So if you look at around 2 million euros, you can see uh, if I look across all the data points, it seems that none of them is actually above uh, 2 million euros. Uh, and that is uh, despite you know the size of market cap. We have a few or a couple of outliers, especially one in Sweden, uh, but in general, it looks like there's also a glass ceiling of 2 million euros in base salary, you know, no matter uh, how, how big the market cap is for, for each company. And that actually also includes uh, Novo Nordisk, Equinor and AstraZeneca, if I also had them uh, on the screen. Um, yeah, then uh, if I again turn back to, uh, to uh, the CEO base salary, I think uh, now we see there is a size effect. So what if we actually took the data and look at companies below 5 billion euros in market cap and look at companies above 5, million, uh, 5 uh, billion euros in market cap and, and look at what is the media, median uh, base salary. And as we can see, the multiplier effect uh, is actually uh, between one and a half and, and, and two times for all the countries. They're actually quite similar for Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, uh, around 1.5 times uh, base salary, and slightly higher for Norway, where it is two times, um, you can say, two times base salary for larger companies. But they are also coming from a lower level, as you can see on the screen, compared to the um, to the other countries. Um, then finally, uh, I would like to say two words. Sorry, two words about uh, board pay. So we also have done a number of analysis on the board pay. And then the first line, you can see the median pay for, uh, for general uh, members, and uh, which is uh, quite similar for Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, uh, whereas uh, Norway is actually significant below uh, the other countries. If we look at the, the chairperson, uh, on the other hand, it looks like that the, the, pay, the pay for chairpersons in Denmark is significantly above the other countries. And we can also see that for what we call the, uh, the, the multiple, the chairperson pay multiple, that for Denmark is actually three times a, a general member of the board, whereas it's approximately two to 2.5 times in the other Nordic countries. So there seems to be a, a difference there, which, uh, yeah. 
Uh, I think uh, I think that's all I would present for today. So I'll leave the word back to uh, Torbjörn. Thank you, Tinas, and um, good afternoon, Harlan. I can't see you right now, but I believe you're there. You are. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Good there. afternoon. I believe you're joining us from uh, from Stockholm this afternoon. That's correct. So we we do appreciate Harlan you taking the time to to join our webinar today and. By way of introduction, may, may I ask you to um, describe the role of Sevian Capital in the global capital markets as well as in the Nordics, uh, and also your own role at um, Sevian Capital? Sure. So Sevian is a concentrated equity investor in European public markets. We're often called an activist investor or constructivist because we buy big stakes in a limited number of companies that, that we think have good fundamentals, but which we can help become better companies over time. That encompasses operational improvements, strategy structure changes, financial changes, governance changes, and ESG changes. I'm one of the senior people and I work across the portfolio. In addition, I have responsibility for ESG. Thank you. And uh, uh, can you please also share some of your perspectives on current remuneration policies, design structures for uh, incentive programs and reporting practices in the Nordics? And I mean, are, are companies consistent, you think, and, and are they transparent enough on pay targets? Sure. Well, I, first, let, let me say that um, while we invest across Europe and and uh, we are often in the boards of the company, so we see things from the outside as an investor and owner, as well as from the inside. Of course, the Nordics have some of the very best companies in Europe. And actually, in terms of pay practices, they're pretty good for the most part in terms of actual pay. Certainly nothing for Nordic companies to be embarrassed about compared to amounts paid to UK and let alone US executives. But what's actually very sad to see is that a lot of that, um, the, the great facts and the great credibility that Nordic companies should have outside of the Nordics isn't being used. In fact, it's being harmed in particular by the relatively low transparency that's provided into pay metrics and especially pay targets by most companies. And so seeing your numbers today where um, ISS recommended against or yes, but with reservations for nearly 80% of Nordic companies, that is just a, a shock and to me a crying statement that um, there's, there's easy gains to be made here by Nordic companies. Thank you, Arlen. That, that, that's really some interesting perspectives you, you share. And I'll, I'll hand over to, to Martin for, for some uh, additional questions for you. Yes, and uh, thank you, Harlan. And also in the, in the preparations, we talked a lot about ESG, of course. ESG is, is a focus globally. Uh, and also in the Nordics. And sometimes we like to think of us having something is cooking in the Nordic countries, that we're doing something well, that we have a good uh, Nordic corporate governance model. However, how are we doing in your uh, in mind in terms of uh, our uh, experience and maturity uh, on ESG uh, target setting into executive remuneration? Sure. So um, first to put this in context, I, I think the Nordics do have a really good corporate governance model generally. And um, certainly the populace and I hope most companies think that uh, sustainability is very important. But, but in certain respects, Nordic companies are lagging way behind what's happening in the rest of Europe and even what's beginning to uh, gain momentum in the US. And this is the inclusion of ESG metrics in the right way into pay. And in the right way is really important. So I'm going to return to that as well. Just to tell you in terms of Sevian's own perspective on this, 
What, what happened was a few years ago when we began, frankly, to take ESG much more seriously as we saw that if done right, if embraced into the strategies of companies, it could be a real driver of long-term value of the companies. We saw too much greenwashing going on. And it was natural for us to look at incentives because when we go into companies, we always look at the incentives as a way to try to get better performance. And when we looked at ESG and incentives, we saw there was often a disconnect. First off, we saw um, a lot of sustainability in nice sustainability reports but not too much in the boardroom and certainly not enough on the plate of the CEOs. This was most apparent in cases where companies had 2030 emissions targets or 2040 emissions targets, because that's going to be two or three or four CEOs away from um, where we are today. And yet we all depend on those management teams to do the right thing today and tomorrow to, for us to have any chance for companies to hit their targets and for the world to avert a catastrophe in my perspective. So we came out with a policy last year where we said all European companies should have ESG metrics incorporated into pay, which are three things. Number one, significant, and that means tied to strategy, and also big enough to matter for the execs. Number two, they should be measurable. And this means they should be discrete, clearly identifiable metrics, not just another line item in a management scorecard, which is basically a form of greenwashing, or that's how it's seen by most investors. And number three, the targets themselves should be transparent to investors so that and and more broadly to the organizations and to all stakeholders so that companies can use those to demonstrate their ambition level to everyone and of course to give management teams the incentives to do the right thing over the next few years that are necessary for the longer term and to create a sense of accountability um, where that isn't done. And we said that that was so important that we would be voting against our companies that didn't have um, plans consistent with our policy over the next 12 months. It turns out we were the first um, relatively known investor to take this approach. Not long after, um, Allianz Global Investors, which probably owns the company of every single person um, coming from a company today, uh, took a similar approach, although they said they were going to start with European large caps. And increasingly, this is in the focus of investors, and we will see more and more and more of this coming um, in, in this AGM season and subsequently. And so my loud and clear message to people listening today is this is coming, and you have a few choices. You can be a laggard. You can be in the middle of the pack somewhere, or you could still just barely, but especially in the Nordics, be amongst the leaders to grasp this. And then in any event, whenever you do it, it's absolutely crucial that you do it right and you provide the measurability of metrics and the transparency so that everyone can see what your targets actually are. Thank you, Holland. That makes totally sense. It resonates so well, I guess, to measure really the ESG progress that you mentioned that is significant. It must be measurable and it must be transparently reporting. Are there any countries where the Nordic countries could look to, for example, the UK or the Netherlands, that we can learn from in this respect, both in terms of transparency on pay targets in general and on ESG progress? Sure. Well, in terms of the transparency of pay targets in general, as we already marked, um, the Nordics actually are lagging other countries and, and the UK is the easiest one to point to. But actually, we've been looking at this and it is across most countries. And again, it doesn't seem to be for any good reason. It seems to be just because this is historical precedent. I mean, in countries where on your on your mobile phone in some cases you can find out what someone is earning every year it seems a little strange and a bit of a missed opportunity 
to um, not demystify why and how people are getting paid. So it's a clear opportunity. And, and just another perspective, um, I'm based in London and you know the, the Nordics, people love Nordic companies. Investors love Nordic companies. But at the same time, it's often seen as quite a clubby environment with a little uh, a limited number of um, owners and investors who are often in the boards. And it doesn't help matters when you're not transparent about things like pay. It makes the situation worse. And a lot of the countries trade at a discount to other capital markets and addressing that would, would probably um, further add to the credibility of Nordic companies as well as hopefully the valuation. In terms of ESG metrics, um, this battle is, is, is over, so to speak, in, uh, in the UK. We'll probably see 75% maybe of FTSE companies this year who are now going to have um, ESG metrics in pay. Not all of the metrics are good enough, and, and that's up, I, I don't know, probably 30% uh, over the last three years or so. I'm, I'm, you know, those are very round numbers and depends on how what you measure um, to, uh, to, you know, to, to, will dictate what the numbers are. But the trend is very clear. And now the focus is very much on making sure that the metrics are good enough. And, and here, let me just stop and comment and say that one obvious thing that many companies have done now that have important emissions targets is they have broken down those 2030 targets into shorter term roadmaps and they are then embedded in the LTIPs. It's a very clear way to do it. And I would say that any company that doesn't that, that has an important target like that, that isn't anchoring it in the pay of the management teams today, um, is that's just a recipe for trouble down the road. And that any final recommendation for the large cap companies in the Nordics uh, yeah. for the AGM I, season I, coming up? I, I, I think I've hammered on this point about transparency. It's such an easy win to change the mindset from we will give the minimum information required by law to we will give the maximum information. It, of course, not giving away anything that is commercially sensitive. So there might be um, short term measures tied to profitability or growth of new business areas or whatnot. It's understandable why a company wouldn't want to put that out in the public domain. But other pay targets, um, TSR uh, targets or overall profitability targets or things of that nature, your other countries and your peers that you are being benchmarked against in other countries are giving that information to all of their investors and their stakeholders. So I really encourage you to change the paradigm and try to make transparency a North Star because it's going to benefit your company, your organization, and your entire country's capital markets to do it. Thank you very much, Harlan, for your key messages. Well thought. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir, and, and welcome afternoon. joining us in, in, in here in the studio. Um, I mean, obviously, we, we hugely appreciate your participation in, in, in the webinar here as well. And, and to introduce you to the audience, could you please uh, briefly describe Novo Nordisk and your overall role at Novo Nordisk? Yes, thank, and thank you for having me here. Novo Nordisk is a pharmaceutical company based here in Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. We are focused on a few disease areas such as diabetes and other chronic diseases. Our medicines are primarily injectable uh, medicine. Uh, and I think we are, uh, if taken by market capitalization, number four in, uh, in Europe uh, at the moment across all uh, industries. I'm a lawyer based in legal. Uh, focus areas include investors and shareholders, remuneration policy and, and remuneration report. Well, thank you. So, so please tell us, um, 
how you support the remuneration committee and uh, ensure that they are able to effectively meet the actual increasing demands and expectations from investors and other stakeholders in, in, in terms of both reporting and um, transparency that we've heard so much from Harlan about. Yeah, we do two things. We take uh, external advice, uh, both in terms of trends and, uh, and, and requirements and benchmarks. And we do the same internally, i.e. we follow up on trends and uh, see what other companies are doing. And we provide both uh, perspectives to the, to the remuneration committee to ensure that they, they actually are, are fully in, informed. Uh, so we try to see who are the best and then try to pre uh, present what best look like. And just to quickly follow up on one of Martin's questions before, are, are you looking at any particular country in the Nordics for input, benchmark, inspiration? When we talk about uh, executive pay, we look at across the Nordic industries, as well as our peers in European pharma. When we talk about reporting, we tend to look at a European pharma because our peer group is the industrial uh, companies outside the Nordic uh, region and pharma companies are our peer group uh, in the industry that we compete in. Okay. Well, Søren, thank you so much for sharing that. Now I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Martin, to uh, also add, add some questions for, for Søren. Yes, of course, we know each other uh, from working together, but I was very impressed by the annual reporting uh, process for your remuneration report uh, for last year. Uh, so can you please elaborate on how you work with that as a project? Uh, how do you manage the, the stakeholders throughout the year? Uh, yeah, could you please? Yes, it has, of course, a huge interest uh, you know, by many, many stakeholders. You can say that we have, if you take the remuneration committee, we have four touch points with the remuneration committee. Uh, so in fir around 1st May, uh, May, we provide an insight to what was the feedback on the previous reporting. So media attention, uh, shareholder, investor context, the voting on uh, and discussions and an energy meeting, internal feedback. So we do that uh, uh, around 1st May. Then in uh, around 1st October, we then look into what has happened since and provide a, a, a suggestion for how we should approach the next reporting, uh, what should be changed. Then uh, in mid-November, we provide a model report to the uh, remuneration uh, committee, i.e. A, a report without the performance figures. And then of course, in January, we provide the uh, the report, the final report with performance figures. And we run it, as you say, as a project. I'm the project manager. We have a working group consisting of me, one from finance and one from P&O. We meet from 1st September to 1st February every week, one hour, uh, and then uh, work, work, work uh, through the, uh, the, uh, the report. We have then uh, both internal stakeholders that we have mapped and say, these would uh, want or would like to provide input. We have three executives wishing to provide input. Uh, and when we have, uh, for instance, our auditor Deloitte or uh, internal, uh, group internal audit having a wish to review and audit the, uh, the report. So we manage these uh, stakeholders through a, a project plan. I'm quite curious on the new themes that might emerge this year and some learnings for the audience here. Uh, are there any new developments about linking executive pay to the wider workforce pay? Uh, are there some trends around addressing increased cost of living at Novo Nordisk? You can, you can say, I cannot reveal what we are going to do. You know, we, you know, we can refer back to the, to the report what we have uh, done. You can say uh, on executive pay, uh, will be reported in uh, in uh, in January uh, next year, but but we are already disclosed publicly uh, that uh, we will uh, advance uh, the inflation adjustment. Uh, normally, for instance, in Denmark, it's first April and first July, uh, 
for the will be advanced that to 1st January uh, this year. And that's actually uh, going to affect all of our, our employees, not only Denmark, but uh, across the, uh, the world. Uh, how that will affect executive pay, you'll have to see and, and, and read that in the, in the report sure. uh, in, uh, in a, you know, half a year from now. Fair enough. Another theme that we talked about is the level of transparency, and obviously there is some at a level where you can also provide too much uh, information that's uh, commercially sensitive. But how, how do you balance that discussion with your stakeholders? Where should the ambition levels be for Novo Nordisk? Yeah. If you look back, we have also been on a journey. Uh, we have been fairly transparent uh, for many, many, many years, but we have also increased transparency uh, over the years. And it's always a, a try, a, 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 as, you say, as you say, a balance, but it's try to take a step and see whether it works. And if it works, uh, the remuneration committee and the board dares to take the next uh, step. And for us, in uh, it uh, in the in the working group, it is providing the opportunity for the remuneration committee to actually to take the, those steps. They may tell us then to uh, scale back, but they should at least have the ability to uh, go uh, go forward. There are still areas where we can be more transparent, uh, a few areas, and this year we will have that discussion with the remuneration committee whether we should take uh, uh, one step uh, further into to, uh, to be more transparent. And maybe the final theme around ESG that we talked so much about uh, during this uh, meeting here. Uh, Novo Nordisk has been a leader in ESG for many, many years, uh, 20 or more. So, but how are you working with the ESG uh, metrics and the target setting? How do you embed it into the executive remuneration, but also the culture in the organization? Yes. As you said, you know, uh, we've been working with the ESG for many years. Our, and I actually, our first KPI in the incentive program, in the long-term incentive program, was introduced in 2004, so close to 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago. And, and, and we actually just take what we do in, in terms of strategy and implement it directly in the incentive program. So we have a 10-year strategy, uh, it's uh, revised every year, that is then folded into some strategic aspirations and that is then mirrored into the uh, into the uh, incentive programs, and and this year we uh, uh, or last year uh, last year we had six ESG targets in the in the program, accounting for between around twelve to sixteen percent of the uh, of the incentives, uh, and they, as I said, mirrors the strategy already in place within uh, ESG. Thank you, Sean. I think we need to round off here a bit. We could continue this uh, conversation for many, many hours, I'm sure. But uh, thank you for now. Welcome. Okay, um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one here is. Um, can you state that CEOs get paid in their variable pay based on market and less on performance relative to peers? And I guess market means mar market-based metrics. Hmm. Any, bit, yeah. Will you start, Maybe I can start off. Yeah, yeah, it's probably a bit difficult to say uh, in general, but uh, it depends on how much you really use uh, benchmarking and benchmarking both levels and design structures and the KPIs. Uh, there seems to be a tendency of both having a market perspective like TSR or share price development combined uh, with uh, the business uh, performance metrics linked to strategy, as Søren mentioned. Yeah. And then we need to find out uh, the ESG metrics that are maturing, how much they should be weight into the executive remuneration uh, pay or how they really get incorporated into the business strategies and be embedded uh, in, the, in the culture, as uh, Søren alluded to at Novo Nordisk. So I don't have any fixed numbers, so to say, but it needs to be balanced against the strategy of the companies. Okay. Um, the second question is, uh, is the difference in Denmark for CEO slash board pay due to the proximity to Germany? And I guess it's compared to the other Nordic uh, countries. Do we uh, look south rather than north when we do benchmarking? 
Hmm, maybe that's also yeah. a question for me. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. We don't specifically look to Germany when when we ask to do benchmarking specifically for, for clients as you do at Novo Nordisk as well. Mm. Then you look to peers within Europe or Nordics, uh, those that are most relevant for the companies in terms of attracting CEOs or CFOs or, or talent in general. So you need to define your own peer group at a subtle level. But uh, I don't think we link specifically to Germany as such. No, and could it sometimes also depend on you looking at the industry across Europe rather than Nordic companies when you do benchmarking? True, because you need to get to a decent number of companies, right, to get to that solid, solid peer group, including European and Nordic companies. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anything you would, uh, you would I, add, perhaps? You can say, I, uh, I can say what we do, yeah. and, and we have a Nordic peer group of the 20 largest uh, Nordic companies by market capitalization. Uh, and then uh, we have eight in the European pharma yeah. uh, uh, area. And uh, there's one German, uh, German company, but then there's two UK, two Swiss, one French, uh, one Belgium. Uh, so I wouldn't say that we are influenced by by German practices in in Nordic. No. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.